human bones and called in a world-famous pathologist. He set about the harrowing task of examining the bones. Even for a hardened forensic scientist like Bernard Knight, it was a gruesome experience. The routine was then was to get them out of the soil, <laughs> college soil. It was a horrible liquid mixture of mud, sewage, because Fred had broken the sewage pipe under the floor and decomposed body. So the bones had to be washed several times, and then boxed up and taken for examination. As the grisly excavation continued, one of Britain's best forensic dentists was trying to identify the dead by looking at dental records of people who'd been reported missing over the years. But sometimes it was difficult to know where to look for a possible match. In one case, he was helped by an amazing coincidence. I said that I thought in a young girl like this, this must mean she'd had an injury to her front teeth just before death, not long before death. And one of the lady detectives, WPC, DCs, sort of stuck her hand up and said, you know, can I, can I make a comment? Of course you can, anything's helpful. And she said, well, when I was a school kid, uh, whatever, 10 years, 15 years ago, we were playing hockey with another school in Cheltenham, I think it was, and one of the girls on the other team got a hockey stick in her mouth. Could it be her? And I, I was gobsmacked. I mean, you know, it's a very good question. But of course, the immediate reaction is, oh, don't be silly, you know, it's one in millions. But the real answer is, yes, it could. The dental records of the girl were compared with the skull. It was a perfect match. The dead girl was Lucy Partington. But now the inquiry faced a new challenge. On New Year's Day 1995, Fred West hanged himself in his prison cell. He'd never implicated his wife, Rosemary, in the murders. Police were going to have to prove her guilt. They made a crucial discovery. Another body had been unearthed at the West's previous home in Midland Road, Gloucester. The kitchen area had already been dug down by the police to a certain level. What they normally did was dig down until they found something they thought were bones and then stop and the light come. So when I got there, there was just a bit of bone projecting from the mud. Um, it is better condition in the middle of the road because it wasn't below the water table. And there we did the same business and excavated the skeleton of this little girl. Now the forensic scientists were to play a key role in the building of the case against Rosemary West. Police suspected the body found at Midland Road was her stepdaughter, Charmaine. If it was, this could be clinching evidence against Rosemary. We needed to get the identification that, that it was Charmaine because she'd gone missing at or about the time, many years before, when Frederick was in jail for some other minor offence. Now, if we could prove A, it was Charmaine, without reasonable doubt, B, when she died, then clearly, if that slotted into Frederick's window of non-opportunity, then Rosemary had a lot of explaining to do. Dr Whitaker compared in minute detail the skull of the little girl with a professional studio photograph of Charmaine. Her smile told him what he needed to know. Having got these brilliant sets of negatives for, for, of photographs of Charmaine, we then merged the information in the photograph electronically with the information in the skull, using her teeth with all sorts of fine detail, and it resulted in a positive identification of Charmaine. Not only that, it enabled us to look at very small growth changes that had occurred between the photograph being taken and death. The dental team said that Charmaine had been murdered during a period in 1971 when Fred West was in prison. This evidence pointed overwhelmingly to Rosemary as her killer. At the trial, she denied all charges, but was found guilty of murdering Charmaine and nine other young women. The telling smile of a young girl had given scientists the evidence which helped convict her. In part two, the serial killer who claimed seven victims. And a deadly dish, the wife who nearly got away with murder.
During his three-month reign of terror, the Stockwell Strangler killed seven people in their homes in various parts of London. He didn't kill at random. He always picked the old and infirm as his victims. While he was at large, no elderly person in London was safe. His trademark was covering up family photos belonging to his victims. In the spring of 1986, 78-year-old Nancy Ems was found dead in her bed. It looked like she died peacefully in her sleep. But a pathologist found bruising on the neck. She'd been strangled. Traces of semen were found on her tights. But the body had been removed from the flat before police realized it was murder and the crime scene was not preserved for forensic examination. The same thing happened with his next victim. 67-year-old Janice Cockett was found dead in her Stockwell home. Again, it was thought to be natural causes until the post-mortem revealed she'd been strangled and sexually abused. This time, the killer left some gruesome trademarks. The interesting thing about this particular murder was that she was found naked in bed when she normally wore a nightdress. The nightdress was actually found in the living quarters and it had been cut in three places. Beside the bed, she had a collage of family photos which had been covered by a hand towel from the bathroom. Police managed to get a palm print from the outside of the bathroom window. Three weeks later, the killer struck again at a Stockwell old people's home, claiming two more victims in one night. Somebody broke in during the night. He was seen in a corridor by one of the nurses who chased him armed with a stick. He went into another room and disappeared. She was very frightened and she then immediately phoned police. The police arrived, but it was too late. Valentine Gleim had been sexually assaulted and strangled. Zavignia Stravava had also been strangled. Up until now, these murders of old people in London had not been linked. This was about to change when two officers had a chance meeting. When they were exchanging details of the various murders, they suddenly realised that there were some strikingly similar facts between two of the murders. It was decided that we possibly had a serial killer at large. The murderer would enter people's homes by climbing up drain pipes and sometimes through bathroom windows. These attacks on old people were particularly nasty. He would strangle, he would sexually assault, and he would belittle them, and I believe he would play with the bodies, which was horrendous. As a result of the double murder, police began checking with all old people's homes in South London for suspicious incidents, which might not have been reported. They found that the day before the killings in Stockwell, there'd been an attack on Frederick Prentice in Clapham. Mr. Prentice had been sleeping. He'd woken to find a man kneeling on his body and trying to strangle him. He managed to hit the alarm button by his bed, but the man escaped. Police got a description of him. He was short and of Afro-Caribbean appearance. Prentice was absolutely vital because he was our only live witness. He was the one person that could possibly identify our killer. It wasn't long before the Stockwell Strangler claimed his fifth victim. 82-year-old William Carmen was found strangled in his bed. The killer left his usual trademarks. The victim's nightshirt had been cut in three places. On the mantelpiece, a photograph had been turned to face the wall. It seemed like the killer didn't want to be watched. Three weeks later, pensioner William Downs was found lying dead in his Stockwell flat. The strangler had claimed another victim, but this time the police spotted the clues immediately. The scene was sealed and a forensics team went in. They found a palm print and set about trying to match it to known criminals. It was a major breakthrough. Florence Tisdell was the Strangler's next victim, bringing the death toll to seven. The killer had climbed through a small window on the ground floor. By this time, the killings were front-page news, but the police still didn't have a suspect. The pressure was mounting. We were all very emotionally involved because it was old people. These people were somebody's grandmother. We were worried because 
Where was the next murder going to happen? Who was the next old person to die? Then the vital breakthrough came from analysis of a palm print and fingerprints found at the murder scenes. Brian Jackson got a call from his boss. He said the fingerprints found at the scene of the Cockett murder and the Downs murder have been identified to a known burglar called Kenneth Erskine. I was so relieved and delighted at that news because at last we had a main suspect. Kenneth Erskine was arrested the next day. At last, the Stockwell Strangler had been caught. Investigators found he was a lonely drifter with no friends, no family, no home, and an appalling complex about being of mixed race. He didn't know which race he belonged to. He felt picked on, and I think he expressed himself by trying to dominate others weaker than himself, and particularly old people. Police used the pathologist's evidence to link the crimes. All the victims were strangled, and most had been sexually abused. Erskine was given life with a 40-year minimum for killing seven people. He's now been moved to a high-security mental hospital.